Chromatographic methods which aim at separating various often closely related substances are coming into increasing use in clinical chemistry. An example of a method utilizing the chromatographic principle is analysis of transferrin, the iron binding protein in the serum. Transferrin is often determined together with serum ion in patients with anemia. The principle of the method is to add to the serum specimen iron ions to saturate the transferrin with iron. The surplus iron ions are then removed by running the sample through an aluminum oxide column which binds free iron ions but not protein bound iron. The latter may therefore be determined by an ordinary iron analysis of the fluid which has passed the column. Some stages of the analysis are shown here. The method is colorimetric with final reading on a filter photometer. Recent analytical technical advances have made it possible to determine a large number of enzymes in the serum and this advantage is being utilized extensively for diagnostic purposes. This applies in particular to enzymes of an intracellular localization which catalyzed the metabolic processes of the cells. In cases of cellular degeneration caused, for instance, by traumatic injury to organs, arterial thrombosis or the like, these enzymes are liberated and pass into the blood. Since normally the enzymatic activity in the cells is thousands of times higher than in the plasma, only a comparatively small number of cells have to undergo degeneration to result in a perceptible increase in the enzyme activity in the plasma. In enzyme determinations, the enzyme is usually afforded optimum conditions for developing its activity, as certain experimental conditions must be strictly observed among others, a constant temperature and reaction time. You have now seen a determination of transaminase in the serum. Various reagents have been added to the serum specimen and the enzymatic processes have taken place while the tubes were immersed in a water bath of 37 degrees centigrade. At the end of exactly 10 minutes, the enzymatic process is stopped by protein precipitation with trichloroacetic acid and the tubes are centrifuged. The final measurement is done on the supernatant by determining the fluorescence of the specimen in a special fluorometer. The results are entered in the records whose individual columns, as elsewhere, are provided with a tally to enable the technician to enter the results and other relevant figures in the correct places. In this way, the working procedure is easy to survey and to check. In certain cases, it may be of diagnostic value to be able to establish with accuracy from which organ a liberated enzyme is derived. This may be done by enzyme electrophoresis. A piece of filter paper is immersed in the serum specimen laid on an agar plate which is placed in an electric field to make the enzymes move in the agar together with the serum proteins. The fact is that enzymes from different organs have very special rates of movement in such a field. After the electrophoresis, the agar plate with the separated enzymes is brought into contact with another agar plate containing the substrate which activates the enzymes. After a suitable incubation period, the position of the enzyme may be located by the change in the substrate concentration. This is done by fluorometric analysis and the localization may then be correlated with the various serum protein fractions shown here after staining of the plate. Often, it is advantageous to apply extensive automation of the analysis. This reduces the risk of error and eliminates subjective estimation. 
The termination of chloride in serum is done by titration of the serum specimen with silver nitrate during magnetic stirring. By means of a silver electrode and a reference electrode, the potential of the fluid may be measured continuously and changes during the titration may be observed. After determination of the potential corresponding to the end point of the titration, meaning that free silver ions appear in the fluid, the apparatus may be adjusted by these buttons so that the supply of silver nitrate stops automatically when the titration has run its course. This is indicated visually when the neon lamp on the left switches on. The titrator is applicable for a number of other analyses. Here you see the apparatus in combination with a titrograph used for the determination of cholinesterase. The procedure is to keep the pH in a mixture of serum and saline solution with acetylcholine constant at 7.40. By decomposing acetylcholine, the cholinesterase releases acetic acid, the rate of release increasing proportionally to the activity in the sample. This process causes a decrease of pH. To counteract this and to keep experimental conditions constant, sodium hydroxide is added at a rate regulated automatically by means of a glass electrode corresponding to the release of acetic acid. Thus, the rate at which the apparatus adds sodium hydroxide is an indicator of the enzyme activity. The speed of addition may be recorded graphically as it is expressed by the slope of a drawn curve. Potentiometric measurements may also be used with advantage for determining pH and bicarbonate. To determine standard bicarbonate in plasma, heparin and fluoride are added to the blood to prevent clotting and glycolysis, respectively. The samples are rotated to ensure homogeneity before being poured into special bubbling glasses. The rims of these glasses are coated with silicone emulsion to prevent foaming during the subsequent bubbling of the blood with an oxygen-carbon dioxide mixture. The bubbling glasses are placed in a water bath of 38 degrees centigrade and a small plastic tube is immersed in the blood and connected with a tubing system to the cylinder containing the predetermined gas mixture to be used for the bubbling. Now the cylinder is slowly opened and the blood sample is bubbled for five minutes the speed of bubbling being assessed by the passage of air through water. The exact carbon dioxide tension in the cylinder is calculated daily on the basis of the percent carbon dioxide content of the cylinder and the barometric reading of the day. The final measurement is done by a glass electrode and a pH meter. First, the pH meter is adjusted by measuring while the electrode is filled with a buffer of a known pH. The electrode is rinsed with water and again filled with buffer for new adjustment, suction being produced by pressing a finger against a hole at the back of the electrode. The sensitive part of the electrode is the capillary tube, shown now filled with blood. This tube holds 20 to 25 microliters. It is fixed centrally in a glass chamber which a thermostat keeps at 38 degrees centigrade. The bicarbonate content of the plasma is read direct on the scale in milliequivalents per liter. 
In a modification of this method, micro-equipment is used, which permits the reading of the acid-base balance on capillary blood. The capillary blood is drawn into a glass tube containing heparin and stirred with a magnet and the small piece of iron wire in the tube. The ends of the glass tube are cut off. The blood is emptied into a special equilibration chamber through which a gas mixture is led while the chamber is shaken at a rate of about 2,500 times a minute so that the blood whirls up along the sides of the chamber. Thereupon, the pH of the equilibrated blood is measured and the acid-base values may be calculated. In addition to all the apparatus used in the daily routine, a great deal of special equipment is required for purposes of control and further advances. Here you see the self-recording spectrophotometer in action. Automatically, it records graphically the quantity of light absorbed by a sample at the various wavelengths of the spectrum. This apparatus is also used for special routine studies, for instance, for determining hemoglobin derivatives in the spinal fluid, which is of importance in diagnosing hemorrhages in the central nervous system. This is an X-ray spectrofluorometer which measures the X-ray fluorescence of inorganic substances. In principle, it permits the determination of all elements whose atomic number is above 12. We use it for the routine determination of calcium in the serum and urine. Another special apparatus is the self-recording spectrofluorometer which measures and records the intensity of the fluorescence produced by exposing the sample to light of various wavelengths. We use it for the routine determination of, for instance, adrenaline and noradrenaline in urine and plasma. It is of the utmost importance to the laboratory to have a workshop for doing repairs and constructing new apparatus. This apparatus was constructed in our workshop for preparing our disposable tubes with anticoagulants. Aqueous solutions of the anticoagulants are added in measured amounts and then dried. At the same time, a colored ring is painted on the tubes to distinguish between the various types. When a technician has completed a series of analyses, the results are checked before being entered on the pink requisition slips. Here, the slips have been placed on small shelves, one for each department, so that by turning the stand, it is easy to get hold of the bundle of slips from the department concerned. When all the results have been entered on the slips, they are checked by the head technicians. Not until all these precautions have been observed can the slips be returned to the various wards where the nurses then enter the results on the laboratory forms. This enables the physician to survey the results and to compare them with previous results or with the normal values which the laboratory has to supply for each individual analysis. This film was meant to give you an impression of the working procedure and organization of a central laboratory and of the development of a new discipline. This development is still in rapid progress and other laboratory specialities, such as clinical physiology and clinical bacteriology, will presumably soon be added. This extension of our hospital service is due to the joint efforts of the medical profession and the authorities in the endeavor to give to every patient the benefit of the practical utilization of theoretical conquests.